The Book of Wonder by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Injudicious Prayers of Pombo the Idolater Pombo the Idolater had prayed Amuz a simple prayer, a necessary prayer, such as even an idol of ivory could very easily grant, and Amuz has not immediately granted it. Pombo had therefore prayed to Tharma for the overthrow of Amuz, an idol friendly to Tharma, and in doing this offended against the etiquette of the gods. Tharma refused to grant the little prayer. Pombo prayed frantically to all the gods of idolatry, for though it was a simple matter, yet it was very necessary to a man. And gods that were older than Amuz rejected the prayers of Pombo, and even gods that were younger and therefore of greater repute. He prayed to them one by one, and they all refused to hear him. Nor at first did he think at all of the subtle, divine etiquette against which he had offended. It occurred to him all at once, as he prayed to his fiftieth idol, a little green jade god whom the Chinese know, that all the idols were in league against him. When Pombo discovered this, he resented his birth bitterly, and made lamentation, and alleged that he was lost. He might have been seen, then, in any part of London, haunting curiosity shops, and places where they sold idols of ivory or of stone, for he dwelt in London with others of his race, though he was born in Burma, among those who hold Ganges holy. On drizzly evenings of November's worst, his haggard face could be seen in the glow of some shop pressed close against the glass, where he would supplicate some calm, cross-legged idol till policemen moved him on. And after closing hours back he would go to his dingy room, in that part of our capital where English is seldom spoken, to supplicate little idols of his own. And when Pombo's simple, necessary prayer was equally refused by the idols of museums, auction rooms, shops, then he took counsel with himself, and purchased incense, and burned it in a brazier before his own cheap little idols, and played the while upon an instrument such as that wherewith men charm snakes, and still the idols clung to their etiquette. Whether Pombo knew about this etiquette, and considered it frivolous in the face of his need, or whether his need, now grown desperate, unhinged his mind, I know not. But Pombo the idolater took a stick, and suddenly turned iconoclast. Pombo the iconoclast immediately left his house, leaving his idols to be swept away with the dust, and so to mingle with man, and went to an arch-idolater of repute, who carved idols out of rare stones, and put his case before him. The arch-idolater who made idols of his own rebuked Pombo in the name of man for having broken his idols, for hath not man made them, the arch-idolater said, and concerning the idols themselves he spoke long and learnedly, explaining divine etiquette, and how Pombo had offended, and how no idol in the world would listen to Pombo's prayer. When Pombo heard this he wept and made bitter outcry, and cursed the gods of ivory and the gods of jade, and the hand of man that made them. But most of all he cursed their etiquette, that had undone, as he said, an innocent man. So that at last that arch-idolater, who made idols of his own, stopped in his work upon an idol of jasper, for a king that was weary of Wosh, and took compassion on Pombo, and told him that though no idol in the world would listen to his prayer, yet only a little way over the edge of it, a certain disreputable idol sat who knew nothing of etiquette, and granted prayers that no respectable god would ever consent to hear. When Pombo heard this, he took two handfuls of the arch-idolater's beard, and kissed them joyfully, and dried his tears and became his old impertinent self again. And he that carved from Jasper the usurper of Vosh explained how in the village of World's End, at the furthest end of Last Street, there is a hole that you take to be a well, close by the garden wall, but that if you lower yourself by your hands over the edge of the hole, and feel about with your feet till they find a ledge, that is the top step of a flight of stairs that takes you down over the edge of the world. For all that men know, those stairs may have a purpose and even a bottom step, said the arch-idolater, but discussion about the lower flights is idle. 
Then the teeth of Pombo chattered, for he feared the darkness. But he that made idols of his own explained that those stairs were always lit by the faint blue gloaming in which the world spins. Then, he said, you will go by Lonely House and under the bridge that leads from the house to nowhere, and whose purpose is not guessed. Thence past Maharion, the god of flowers, and his high priest, who is neither bird nor cat. And so you will come to the little idol Duth, the disreputable god that will grant your prayer. And he went on carving again at his idol of Jasper for the king who was weary of Wosh. And Pombo thanked him and went singing away, for in his vernacular mind he thought that he had the gods. It is a long journey from London to World's End, and Pombo had no money left, and yet within five weeks he was strolling along Last Street. But how he contrived to get there I will not say, for it was not entirely honest. And Pombo found the well at the end of the garden beyond the end house of Last Street, and many thoughts ran through his mind as he hung by his hands from the edge. But chiefest of all those thoughts was one that said the gods were laughing at him through the mouth of the arch-idolater, their prophet, and the thought beat in his head till it ached like his wrists, and then he found the step. And Pombo walked downstairs. There, sure enough, was the gloaming in which the world spins, and the stars shone far off in it faintly. There was nothing before him as he went downstairs but that strange blue waste of gloaming, with its multitude of stars, and comets plunging through it on outward journeys and comets returning home. And then he saw the lights of the bridge to nowhere, and all of a sudden he was in the glare of the shimmering parlor window of Lonely House, and he heard voices there pronouncing words, and the voices were no wise human, and but for his bitter need he had screamed and fled. Halfway between the voices and Maharion, whom he now saw standing out from the world, covered in rainbow halos, he perceived the weird gray beast that is neither cat nor bird. As Pombo hesitated, chilly with fear, he heard those voices grow louder in Lonely House, and at that he stealthily moved a few steps lower, and then rushed past the beast. The beast intently watched Maharion, hurling up bubbles that are every one a season of spring in unknown constellations, calling the swallows home to unimagined fields, watched him without even turning to look at Pombo, and saw him drop into the Lindlin Larna, the river that rises at the edge of the world, the golden pollen that sweetens the tide of the river and is carried away from the world to be a joy to the stars. And there before Pombo was the little disreputable god who cares nothing for etiquette and will answer prayers that are refused by all the respectable idols. And whether the view of him at last excited Pombo's eagerness, or whether his need was greater than he could bear that it drove him so swiftly downstairs, or whether, as is most likely, he ran too fast past the beast, I do not know, and it does not matter to Pombo. But at any rate he could not stop, as he had designed, in attitude of prayer at the feet of Duth, but ran on past him down the narrowing steps, clutching at smooth, bare rocks till he fell from the world, as, when our hearts miss a beat, we fall in dreams and wake up with a dreadful jolt. But there was no waking up for Pombo, who still fell on towards the incurious stars, and his fate is even one with the fate of Slith. End of The Injudicious Prayers of Pombo the Idolater